There is one gospel on which I stand for all eternity. It is my story, my Father's plan. The Son has rescued me. Oh, what a gospel, oh, what a peace. My highest joy and my deepest need. Now and forever, He is my light. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is one gospel to which I cling, all else I count as loss. For there where justice and mercy meet, he saved me on the cross. And no more I boast in what I can bring, and no more I carry the weight of sin. For he has brought me from death to life. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> there is one gospel where hope is found. The empty tomb still speaks. For death could not keep my Savior down. He lives and I am free. And now on my Savior I fix my eyes. My life is His and His hope is mine. For He has promised I too will rise. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in this gospel, the church is one. We do not walk alone. We have his spirit as we press on to lead us safely home. This is good. And when in glory still I will sing of this old story that rescued me. Praise to my Savior, the King of life. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when in glory still I will sing of this old story that rescued me. Praise to my Savior, the King of life. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise to my Savior, the King of life. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Hello, everyone. So we have been listening to people um, read the scripture, Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. But this time we are all going to say it together. And it's on your binders. See what we did there? Okay, are you guys ready? Okay. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. to do far more abundantly than that all the 
according to the power at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> All right, would you stand again and sing with me? Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father, and there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above, join with all nature and manifold witness. To thy great faithfulness, mercy and love. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. And morning by morning, new mercies I all I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto got to be such a great verse. And pardon for sin and a peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for to Great is thy faithfulness, and morning by morning new mercies I see. Great is thy faithfulness. 
sing one more before Susan comes. <clears throat> Such a comfort to know, isn't it? Oh. And those he saves are his delight. Christ will hold me fast, precious in his holy sight. He will hold me fast and will not let my soul be lost his promises shall last bought by him at such a cost he will hold me fast Hope this is a reality in your life. For my life he bled and died. Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. And raised with him to endless life, he will hold me fast until our faith is turned to sight. When he comes at last, he
You may be seated. Thank you so much for your ministry and music to us and for picking songs that are theologically sound, not vain repetitions. I've been to some conferences where I want to get up and say, well, now that we're done with our vain repetitions, let's get into the Bible. But I don't. I practice self-control. So I do appreciate the music. Uh, that last song, I remember when my husband passed away, uh, my son, who's a pastor in Wichita, he he said one day, he said, Mom, I finally can sing that song without crying. So, um, great song. Um, and I do want to make a clarification. Somebody asked me during the um, lunch hour about that last statement about she will be saved in childbearing if she continues in faith, love, and sobriety. So, I just want to make it clear that two things. Women, the only prohibit, prohib, prohibiting is in this, in this church. Uh, women can be teachers, they can teach at college, they can teach other subjects, uh, geometry, geology, whatever. But uh, what the limitation is in the church teaching the scriptures with men present. So I just want to be clear on that. And then in continuing in faith, love, and sobriety, uh, she will be delivered from the stigma of Eve if, there's that if clause, and I don't think I really clarified that very well, if she continues in what? Her faith in God, her love for others, and self-control. So, yes, you are delivered from that stigma, but you have to continue living out the gospel. And so in those three years. So I, I apologize for not making that clear. Uh, I do want to be clear in my teaching. So uh, we have come to our final session, being grounded in a shaky world. And boy, it's a shaky world, isn't it? Uh, in Oklahoma, we have uh, earthquakes, so it's really shaky sometimes. And and I think they've quit the fracking, so now we're not shaking as much. But I'm not talking about earthquakes, but it does seem like the world is coming apart at all ends. It's raveling, unraveling, and it's very, can be very frightening. But ladies, the Lord wants you to be grounded, uh, even in a shaking world. And so we want to look in this session at some things that might be stealing your peace and making you feel uh, a little bit uncomfortable and a little bit shaky. And I'm going to give you, along with that, some cures for those things. So if you would, uh, turn in your Bibles to John 14. John 14, and we're going to be looking at some beloved uh, portions of God's Word as He is talking and uh, to His disciples before He goes to the cross. John 14, and we'll be looking at 27 through 31. Father, we thank You for this time that we've had. We thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the, the good, sweet music we've had, the the ladies that have led us in that. Thank you for their uh, kindness and their uh, sacrifice for doing that for us. Thank you for the food we had. Thank you for all that have helped, Lord. Uh, what, a, what a joy it's been to see the body of Christ coming together, everybody using their gifts and making this a conference that is um, easy to attend and comfortable. Thank you so much, Father. I do pray, Lord, in this final session that you would help us to stay awake not just physically, but spiritually, Lord, because we do need these words from you because we live in a crazy world and uh, we're secluded here in this, in this church, in this sanctuary. But Lord, we know as we leave this afternoon, uh, something will come that will shake our world. And so, Lord, we want to be women who are stable in a shaky world. So, Father, uh, give grace for this last session, I pray. I ask you in Christ's name. Amen. Well, there's a song that is sung around Christmas time, taken from Handel's Messiah, and actually it's taken from Isaiah 9, 6. And the lyrics go like this. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And I think it's interesting that even unbelievers will go and listen to Handel's Messiah and they will sing about peace during Christmas when they have no peace. And it's interesting because throughout history, mankind has been searching for peace, but they have not found it. In fact, did you know after World War II, the United Nations was created to promote world peace? But do you know, since 1945, there has not been one day of peace. 
Not one day of peace since 1945 when the United Nations was created to promote world peace. In fact, if you don't believe me, uh, when you leave here, just get on your news app and you'll see there's something going on right now. There's some type of turmoil. In fact, do you know wars and crimes have increased since 1945? They are increasing. Ladies, lasting peace is a dream to the world. The New York Times put it well, peace is a fable. Peace is a fable. However, we as Christian women know peace is not a fable. It's a fact, right? If you have the Lord Jesus Christ dwelling in your heart, you can be at peace. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, right? And so we can be at peace, but I'm not too naive to not think that there are some, and there are in this room, and some who are going through things right now in their life that can steal peace. And for all of us, it's that way, right? There are areas we must keep in check, lest we become like the world without peace. And so in our final lesson, we are going to look at five, five peace stealers that the disciples faced. And ladies, we face each one of these ourselves, nothing new under the sun. But as we look at these five peace stealers, I'm going to give you five cures for these peace stealers. So let's read the text together. Uh, verses 27 to 31 of John 14 to discover the five things that can steal your peace. Jesus speaks and he says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world give, give I unto you. Do not let your heart be troubled. Do not let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I'm going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I've told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe I'm no longer going to talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me a commandment, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. Now, ladies, uh, if you'll look just up a few verses in verse 26, because I want you to see the transition here. I don't like jumping in the middle of a text. But if you'll see, uh, as you look up, there's been a, a Christ speaking to them regarding the Holy Spirit uh, in verse 26. And the Holy Spirit is what? He is a byproduct of our salvation. And part of that indwelling of the Holy Spirit, part of that fruit is love, joy, joy peace, right? And so the transition is easy to see that there are, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us, and even though we should be at peace, there are sometimes things that can steal our peace. So let's look at what Jesus says here on the things that can steal our peace. Notice what he says in verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Now, since we're going to be talking about peace and that we need to have peace in a shaky world, what is peace? What is it? Well, peace is rest, which is in contrast with strife. Peace is rest, which is in contrast with strife. Ladies, peace is not a feeling. A lot of women, they, they go through life with their feelings. Uh, peace is not a feeling. Peace is a condition of your soul. It's a condition of your soul. In fact, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom, which relates to everything that is good. So this is a positive word. It's a peace that doesn't make sense in the midst of challenging circumstances. One man says, peace is a divine tranquilizer. <laughs> peace is a divine tranquilizer. I also think it's interesting how peace has been translated into some other languages as they're translating our Bible into other languages. Listen to some of these. Sit down in your heart. <laughs> Have a song in your body. Quiet goodness. Quiet heart. Aren't those great parallels? They're very appropriate. Because, ladies, peace guards our soul against anxiety, strife, and it gives us solace in harmony. I have a family member, a sister who doesn't know the Lord, and she's always saying, Susan, you're, you're at peace all the time. I go, why shouldn't I be? I mean, what's there to be upset about, right? And uh, I would love for her to know the Prince of Peace. Ladies, obviously, it's a spiritual peace that only Christ can give, right? By having a right relationship with him. In fact, notice what Jesus says here. My peace I give to you. So, ladies, Christ's peace is very different from the world's because it's unbroken peace with God, which allows us to be at rest in spite of people or circumstances. And, ladies, that kind of peace is available to you 
and me. And it's interesting, after Jesus dies on the cross and then three days he's risen again, do you know he has to remind the disciples again about this? Remember after his, after his ascension in John 20, it says the same day at evening, being the first day of the week when the doors were open, Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said, peace, <laughs> peace be unto you. And then they were startled, you know, and then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So why does he have to remind him again after he dies on the cross and is resurrected? Same reason you have to be reminded again, right? Right now, some of you might be sitting there and you're like, hey, I'm pretty peaceful. I just had a nice lunch, you know, and, and it's all calm, but wait till you get home in a little bit. And the house is chaos, and the kids have, you know, messed up your house while you're gone, and your husband forgot to change the baby's diaper, and uh, all of a sudden, you're not going to be at peace anymore, right? And so you're going to need to be reminded. That's what happens. That's life, right? And so they're no different than us. We have to constantly be reminded that the Lord gives us peace. I know I can, things can be going so well in my life, and and in fact, Debbie called me or the morning we were supposed to leave, and she said, guess what? I have a water's running out in your backyard or out your house or something so she has that leak to look forward to she turned off her water before she left i think it's your third time for this maybe you need to get a new plumber um <laughs> and so debbie's got that you know and everything can be going great and all of a sudden you know you have a break in your water pipe and all of a sudden you can become unpeaceful and so ladies we need to be at peace so jesus leaves them with the promise of peace but he reminds them this is not the peace the world gives notice what he says not as the world gives do i give to you so it's not the world's peace so that begs the question what kind of peace does the world offer well when you think about it the world says if you want peace you need to be wealthy right get some more money be famous Seek pleasure, sex, alcohol, drugs, gaming, <laughs> whatever it is now. That's what the world says is peaceful. But ladies, that, the world is unable to give the kind of peace that Christ gives. His peace is lasting. It's not dependent on any circumstances, people, or drugs. It's not dependent on that. In fact, several years ago, my husband and I were watching 2020. I don't think it's on anymore, but... Harrison Ford uh, was being interviewed by a reporter, and uh, she asked him, she said, do you have everything in this life that you want? You know what Harrison Ford said? He said, I have everything in this life I want except peace. And he said, I hope to find it when I die. And I thought, wow, here's a man, famous actor, you know, uh, he's very wealthy, I'm sure. You would think he has everything. And yet he doesn't have peace and he hopes to find it when he, when he dies. But ladies, if Harrison Ford doesn't have peace now, he's not going to find it when he dies. And I've seen him several times in uh, plane wrecks. He has a little plane he owns. In fact, he goes to Wichita a lot. My son said he's known to be seen around town there. But he's crashed his plane several times. I remember one time seeing a clip of it on the news. And, you know, my heart just went out. I said, Lord, uh, send someone to share the gospel with him. <laughs> And uh, if you ever look at his face, it's kind, of, it's kind of troubled. He has a very troubled face, if you've ever seen him. Ladies, the world will never know peace. The world will never know peace. The Bible says there's no peace to the wicked. There is no peace to the wicked. The world's not going to find peace because it's a spiritual issue. It's a spiritual issue. Well, after the promise for peace, Jesus gives them a command, one he's already given. He says, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let it be afraid. The Greek tense here reads, let not your heart keep being untroubled. Let not it keep being afraid. And it's hard for us to understand, why does Jesus have to say this to them? He's been giving them all these promises. I'm leaving, but I'm coming again via the Holy Spirit. And when he comes, he's going he's gonna to comfort you. He's going to be gracious to you. And he reminds them of how much he loves them. And, and yet he still had to remind them to not be troubled. But ladies, may I lovingly remind you, we also know many promises in the word, and yet we become troubled. We become troubled. In fact, the word troubled here in the Greek means to be agitated. Jesus says, don't let your heart be agitated. Don't let it be troubled. The word afraid here means to be fearful. And it's a word that revolves to the palpitating of the heart. Have you ever been like, <laughs> you know, your heart is just palpitating? It involves being fearful, timid, afraid. Jesus says, stop it. Stop being afraid. Stop being troubled. So ladies, this is the first peace stealer that can come and steal your peace, and that is a fearful or a troubled heart. A fearful 
or troubled heart. The disciples were fearful and troubled about many things. Think about it. Judas had just gone out to betray the Lord. That's troubling. Peter was going to deny him soon, three times. That's troubling. Jesus was leaving them. That frightened them. They didn't understand what he was trying to say. And ladies, many things come in our lives and they try to steal our peace. There are things that cause our hearts to be fearful. What does our future hold for our children and for us? How am I going to die? Will my husband die before me and leave me a widow? Is my husband going to lose his job? Is my lost loved one going to go to hell? Are they going to get saved? Ladies, there's a lot of things that we can cause that can cause us to be fearful or troubled. Do you want to know the cure for this? The cure for a fearful and troubled heart? Here's the cure for a fearful and troubled heart. Pray. Pray. Remember what Paul said to the church at Philippi? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. Paul tells us four times in that one verse, don't be anxious, but pray. And he uses four Greek words for pray. In everything by prayer, that's worship, and supplication, that's earnestness in prayer, like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, with thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to trust you. And the fourth Greek word is petition. Lord, help me. <laughs> I need to ask for certain things. So four times he tells us, instead of being fearful, instead of being troubled, pray, worship, supplicate, be thankful for the opportunity to trust the Lord. Ladies, that's the cure. Also in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says what? Don't be worried about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to put on. Don't be fearful. Don't be troubled. You know what you're to do first? Jesus says, seek first my kingdom, my righteousness, and then everything will fall into place. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough trouble of its own, right? And so the same thing. Jesus is saying the same thing in the Sermon on the Mount. As Paul says, seek first my kingdom. Worship me. Pray. Trust the Lord. Ladies, be prayerful, be concerned with things of the kingdom. Jesus says, stop being anxious, stop being troubled, stop being afraid. Well, next in verse 28, Christ mentions a second thing that will rob the disciples and us of our peace. Notice what he says. You've heard me say to you, I'm coming away, I'm going away, sorry, and coming back to you. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said I'm going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Christ has already mentioned to them many times, I'm leaving you, I'm going away, I'm leaving you. He said it in chapter 13, he said it in chapter 14. He's been trying to prepare them. I know my husband many times in the, uh, he contracted, uh, not before he contracted COVID and passed away, he had a stroke four years before he contracted COVID. And he was back in the pulpit and strong and everything. But I know the last year of his life before he contracted COVID, he would say often in the pulpit, I I'm going to be shuffling off soon. I'm going to be shuffling off soon. And I kept saying, honey, how do you know that? He goes, I just know. He said, I won't live to, lit to uh, see my 70th birthday. And I said, how do you know that? He said, I just, I just know. And my body's getting weaker. And, and so he kept telling the congregation, I hope to just die in the pulpit. So just dig a hole there and bury me and uh, go on with your... I was like, that'd be horrible. Don't do that, honey. So thankfully, the Lord spared us from him dying in the pulpit. But, uh, but Jesus has been doing the same thing. He's been trying to tell them. I'm leaving. I'm going away. But he says, I'm going to come again. How will he do this? By the dear Holy Spirit that he just spoken of in the previous verses. I'm going away, but I'm coming again. How? The Holy Spirit. The Greek word is alos, one of the same kind. He's coming. So ladies, the second piece, stealer, is change in relationships. Change in relationships. Jesus said, I'm going away. I'm leaving you. My relationship with you will no longer be the same. No longer will you be able to touch me. No longer will you be able to hear me speak words audibly. No longer will I be discipling you. You won't see me do the miracles. I will not be. Ladies, can you imagine how that frightened the disciples? They had been discipled by Jesus Christ. They couldn't speak audibly to him anymore. They couldn't ask their questions. This frightened them. They were frightened. Ladies, change in relationships can rob us of our peace. I know before my husband passed away, my sister passed away. I'd just seen her on uh, her birthday. She looked great, healthy. I said, Mary, you're the most beautiful I've ever seen you. Three weeks later, she was dead. She was full of cancer, didn't know it. 
And we went to her funeral, and I believe that's where my husband contracted COVID-19, and he died right after that. So that was a sudden change in relationships. I lost my spouse. I lost a sister. And ladies, I know you can recall many times the Lord changes relationships with family members or friends. It's hard, isn't it? But even in the midst of the change, we can have peace, right? The cure for this peace dealer, change in relationships, is this. Ladies, believe in a sovereign God who works out everything according to his will. If you do not believe in the sovereignty of God, you will continue to shake in this shaky world. You will continue to shake when things come into your life. If you do not believe that God is sovereign over every event, every circumstance of your life, Ladies, we have to believe all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. And if you don't believe that, you're going to be shaky. You're going to be fearful. You are going to be troubled. You will not be at peace. Remember Job in the midst of all his change in relationships, losing his 10 kids, having a wife that forgot to read The Excellent Wife and told him to curse God and die? And remember what he said, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. After losing all of his kids. That's a, that's a hard thing, right? But he could do that. He had a relationship with the Lord. Ladies, there's no reason for being unsettled when change comes in relationships. Why? You and I have the same Holy Spirit. Promised to us as it was promised to the disciples. Christ dwells in us by way of his spirit. Ladies, remember, God is the blessed controller of every event of your life. Remember the comfort of the Holy Spirit when there is change in relationships. And I know it's not just deaths. I've lost many close friends due to standing for what's right. Uh, women that have worked side by side with me in ministry who have betrayed me. Uh, it's hard. Those things are hard. They're painful. You can't dismiss the pain. But ladies, even when there's change in relationships, we have to believe in the sovereignty of God, that he has a purpose. Well, Jesus then says a very startling statement. Note what he says. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I'm going to the Father. The tense of the Greek verb here indicates the disciples did not love Jesus at this present time as they should. If you love me, you're not loving me like you were. If you love me, you would rejoice. Why? I'm going to the Father. I'm going home. You would rejoice with me. The word for love here is agapeo, which indicates a direction of one's will and finding joy in something. What's Jesus saying to them? You're not finding your joy in the fact that I'm going to get to go back home. I get to go back to the Father. You're not rejoicing with me. You're not loving me as you should right now. You're not finding your joy in this. Why? They were too occupied with their own grief. <laughs> they didn't want him to leave. They didn't want him to go. Instead of grieving, they should rejoice at the divine plan which entailed the Lord to return back to heaven to the Father. They should rejoice that soon the Holy Spirit would come and take up residency in them as they minister for Christ. Ladies, true love does not seek its own way. True love looks out for the interest of others. And their love for Christ was selfish. It was selfish at this point. They didn't want him to leave. So ladies, the third peace dealer is this, lack of love for God. Lack of love for God. If you loved me, you would rejoice. Ladies, when we don't love the Lord as we should, with complete devotion of our life, it takes away our peace. When we're selfish with our love, to the Lord, it robs us of our peace, and there's an unrest in our soul. Ladies, the cure for not loving God as we should is this, is doing the first works. And let me explain that. The cure for not loving God as you should is doing the first works. You might say, what are you talking about? You remember John, the apostle who wrote the book of John? He also wrote the book of the Revelation. And remember the book of the Revelation? Jesus is writing to the seven churches and remember the first church he writes to is Asia, and he writes, to, he writes to the seven churches at Asia. The first one he writes to is the church at Ephesus. And remember what he says to them? He says, these things he says, who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, he says, I know your works, your labor, your patience. You cannot bear with those who are evil. You've tested those who say they are apostles and not. You have found them to be liars. 
You've persevered. You have patience. You've labored for my name's sake. You've not become weary. And then he says this, nevertheless, I have something against you. You've lost your first love. You've, they're doing all the right things. Doctrinally right, but you've lost your first love. You're not loving me as you should. And you know what he says? Remember from where you were fallen and repent and do the first works. Do the first works. And if you don't, I'm going to come quickly and remove your lampstand. Those are strong words, huh? Ladies, that was the problem with the church at Ephesus. They did not love God as they should. They weren't loving God. They had their doctrine right. But they weren't loving God. The disciples were not loving God, Jesus, at that time as they should. And Jesus tells the church at Ephesus, repent and do the first works. What does that mean, do the first works? Well, ladies, think about it. The first works would entail what? What was your life like when you embraced the Lord Jesus Christ? Return there. The same zeal, the same love, the same passion, the same prayer that you started with when you first embraced Christ. I love new Christians. I, I think it's so fun to hear them pray. I mean, they're, they're just so real, you know, <laughs> and they don't have all that theology that messes up their prayer life. Not that that messes up, but they're, they're just so genuine, a new baby Christian, that passion, that zeal. They're so hungry for the word and, and they're just sold out completely. And that's the cure for lack of love for God, ladies. Go back to that same love, that same zeal. As I mentioned, I think last night or maybe today, time's going so fast. And my daughter would say, Mom, why do, why do people lose their zeal as they age? Why do they, why do they lose their zeal for Christ when they get old? I said, honey, they shouldn't. Those should be their best years. Those should be their best years. They should just burn out for Jesus, right? Well, Jesus says, if you love me, you will rejoice. Why? Because I'm going to the Father. The disciples did not love the Lord as they should, and it was robbing them of their peace. Ladies, this phrase also explains why funerals of believers should be a time of rejoicing, not sorrow. Why? Oh, yeah, did I sorrow? Still do. I miss my husband. But you know what? My husband's in glory. has been almost for three years this August. I should be rejoicing. I mean, He's not thinking about me probably at all, you know. Uh, I, he's probably talked to all the, you know, Spurgeon and Calvin, and I don't know who else up there, but, but uh, he's having a good time, right? I should be rejoicing. We need to remember our tears are for us, right? Our loved ones are in a better place. Well, Christ then has a statement that the Jehovah's Witness and the Mormons love. <laughs> for my father is greater than I. What did Jesus mean by this statement? We know he and the Father are one, right? He already said that in John 10, 30. I and the Father are one. So how can the Father be greater than the Son? Well, Paul gives us the answer. You can turn there. You can just listen in Philippians what he says this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. And being found and fashioned as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to the cross. Then therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name that is the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. So that, that verse explains how at this time the Father was greater than the Son. How was the Father greater than Jesus? Because as Paul just said, he didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God. He humbled himself. He came to earth and became a man. He took on the form of a man. He humbled himself. He emptied himself of his riches, his glory, his authority. He took on him the form of a servant. Ladies, he stooped from sovereignty to slavery. That's how, at this time, the Father was greater than the Son. So if you have a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness that comes to you and tries to teach you instill this heresy, then you take them to this passage in Philippians. And yes, it's very clear how, at that time, what he gave up. In the days of his incarnation, when Jesus was here, he was below the Father in terms of his outward glory and official position. But remember in John 17, 5, do you remember what Jesus prays? Father, I'm coming restore the glory that I once had with you. I'm coming. So restore that glory when I come back to glory. And that's another place you need to take them. John 17, 5. Well, Jesus then says something in verse 29, which he's already said once in the upper room. Notice what he says. And now I've told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, 
you might believe. Ladies, Jesus is once again considering the disciples as more important than himself, even though he's getting ready to go to the cross. He says, I'm letting you know all of this before it happens. What Jesus is saying this is this, ladies. My death, my resurrection, my ascension, I'm telling you this now. I'm telling you all of this so that when it does happen, your faith will not be shaken. He's prepared them for this. And yet we know that the Bible tells us all the disciples forsook him and fled. But he's trying to strengthen their faith. Jesus is going to be arrested probably with less than 24 hours from the time he's saying this. And that undoubtedly is going to shake their faith to their foundation. And so Jesus wanted to prepare them for the strain that leaving them would place on them so they might believe. Ladies, I don't know about you, but there are certain things that Christ has said in his word that strengthen my faith, especially as I see them unfold my eyes. Well, the time with his beloved ones is drawing to a close, and notice what he says in verse 30. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. Jesus says, I'm not going to talk with you very much longer. In fact, the remaining chapters can be said in 10 minutes. 10 minutes. So 10 minutes isn't a lot of time before Judas comes to betray him, is it? And the reason he says, I cannot talk with you much longer, is he says, the ruler of this world is coming. The prince of peace is leaving. The ruler of this world is coming. Who's the ruler of the world? Satan. Satan. Paul describes Satan as the prince of the power of the air. He's also known as the devil, the dragon, the evil one, the angel of the bottomless pit, the god of this age, Apollyon, Abaddon, Belial, Beelzebub. And what did Jesus mean? What's he saying here? Satan is coming. Well, turn back to John 13, 27. We'll see very clear what he's saying when he says Satan is coming. The prince of this world is coming. Look at verse, uh, Jesus has predicted that someone's going to betray him. And notice what he says in verse 26. The one who's going to betray me is the one who I give a sop when I've dipped it. And when he dipped it, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, notice, Satan entered into Judas. And Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Go do it, Judas. So what did Jesus mean when he said the prince of this world is coming? Satan was now inside Judas. He was possessing Judas. Judas. And Jesus said, Judas, what you do, do quickly. And Judas was planning in the next few hours to come and betray the Lord with a kiss. Jesus, Jesus knew this. Jesus was all-knowing. He was aware of the footsteps. He could, he could probably hear, since this, the rest of this could be said in 10 minutes, he could probably hear the footsteps of Judas, the Roman soldiers, the members of the Sanhedrin, all who were led by the prince of the power of the air, Satan, who was indwelling Judas at this time. Christ knew they were on their way. So ladies, the fourth peace dealer is this, the enemy, the devil. The enemy, our enemy, the devil. The prince of this world. I'm sure the disciples were somewhat fearful right now. I'm no longer going to talk with you much longer. The ruler of this world is coming. Ladies, they knew it would change everything. Listen, my friend, do not be ignorant of Satan and his devices. He would like nothing better than to rob you of your peace, and he will do anything to steal that peace, even send a Judas in your life. And I've had it happen in my life many times. It's hard. As I mentioned, I've had at least two friends that were elders-wise very close. One, one told me, she said, uh, Susan, I'd walk on glass for you. And I'm like, really? I wouldn't walk on glass for anybody, but love you, but not that much. And, and then two weeks later, she took that glass and stabbed me in the back. That was hard. And just last year, I lost a friend of 30 years, elder's wife. We were close. We went through a lot of things together. It, it's hard. It's hard when someone that you worship with, you you go to the house of the Lord together, they betray you, you, you think they're your closest friends. It's hard to remain at peace. But ladies, it's possible. It is possible. You might say, well, how is it possible? Susan, what is the cure for the peace dealer, the devil? What is the cure? The cure is found in 1 Peter 5, 8, and 9. Be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil is like a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in your faith. So ladies, here's the cure. You need to be aware, be sober, 
be vigilant, be on the alert. The adversary, the devil, he's walking around seeking whom he may devour. And you know, when, when, uh, the, when the lions roar the most is when it's nighttime, when it's dark. I think that's when Satan tra attacks us the most, when we're not walking in the light, we're walking in darkness. Ladies, be aware, don't be ignorant of his devices. And here's the key, resist him, stand fast in your faith. Get away from him, run away from him. <laughs> as Joseph did when he fled from the enemy. Remember when Potiphar's wife was tempting him every day, have sex with me, have sex with me, come lie with me. And he finally had enough sense to get out. Don't give in to Satan's tactics. Remember how Jesus combated Satan? When Satan said, you know, hey, come worship me or come do this, you know, it is written. And Jesus says, what? No, it is written, it is written, it is written. He used the scripture. So ladies, we need to resist him steadfast. We need to know God's word. Don't give in to Satan's tactics. Jesus wants them to know he has nothing to do with Satan. Notice what he says. He has nothing in me. He has no authority over me. Even though he's coming, the prince of the world is coming, he says, he has nothing in me. Jesus had no fear of Satan. Why? Because Satan had no claim on him. Jesus is going to conquer death. He's going to conquer the enemy. Even though from day one, Satan tried to destroy him back in the Garden of Eden, Satan had nothing in him. Ladies, there's no link of any kind that exists between Jesus and Satan. So then you might be saying, well, Susan, why is Jesus about to yield to Satan and his plans to have Jesus murdered? Why is he going to yield to that? Well, I don't have to answer it. Jesus does. He answers in verse 31. Notice what he says. So the world will know that I love the Father. Why am I going to yield to this plan to have me crucified? Why am I going to do this? It's not because of Satan. But I want the world to know I love the Father. I want the world to know I love the Father, and as the Father gave me the commandment, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do what he's asked me to do. In contrast to Satan, who he has no part with, the world will know and recognize that Jesus loves the Father by going to the cross to die for the sins of the world. Jesus had nothing to do with Satan. Nothing at all. And ladies, his love, I think it's interesting, his love for the Father is manifest by what? His obedience. Whatever the Father says, I'm going to do. That's the way our love for the Father is manifest, right? If we love him, we what? We keep his commandments. Ladies, this act of love would get the attention of the world. How is Christ's love manifest to the Father? By keeping his commandments. Remember what he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane before this? Oh, my Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Prayed it over and over, so much so that sweat drops of blood were falling to the ground. He kept saying, oh, my Father, oh, my Father, let this cup pass from me. And then he would say, nevertheless, not what I want, what you want. And he resigned his will to the Father's will. He obeyed. He obeyed so that the world might know that he loved the Father. Well, Christ ends by saying, arise, let us go from here. Arise, let us go. I'm going to meet my death. So the fifth peace stealer is the fear of the unknown. The fear of the unknown. Arise, let us go from here. The disciples have no idea what's ahead of them. They don't know what's going to happen to the Lord. It's an unrestful time for them. What's going to happen to my Lord? What does it mean to be crucified on the cross? What's going to happen to me? When's Peter going to deny him? When is Judas going to betray him? When is the prince of the world coming? What's he going to do? Ladies, we too in our lives can be robbed of peace if we dwell on the fear of the unknown. What if I lose my husband? What if I lose my child? What if I get cancer? What if I get COVID? What if I lose my job? All the what ifs. <laughs> And we as women dwell on those a lot, right? What if this? What if that? Ladies, all the what ifs can rob us of our peace. What is the cure for this? Isaiah 26, 3 has the cure. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. He will keep you in perfect peace, the one whose mind is stayed on him because his trust is in God. Ladies, the key to this, the cure to this, Get your mind off all the what ifs. Get your mind off all the unknowns. Focus on the solution. What's the solution? Trust in God. Trust in God. Keep your mind fixed on him. 
Ladies, if we would spend more time trusting God, we wouldn't be so worried about all the what ifs. <laughs> we would understand they're in the loving arms of a sovereign God. Now, I'm going to ask you all not to close your notebooks, if you wouldn't, because that makes a lot of clicking. You just have a, two more minutes, but sometimes when I'm winding up with the application questions, I hear all those. So I'm going to ask you to please be quiet while I just finish up, okay? Because I do think it's important as we wrap everything up, okay? So the five peace stealers are this. A fearful of troubled heart. Let not your heart be troubled. The cure, pray, and seek God's kingdom. The second one is change in relationships. I'm going away. What's the cure? Remember the sovereignty of God and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. The third one is lack of love for God. If you love me, you would rejoice. What's the cure? Repent of your lack of love for God and do the things you first did when you trusted Christ. Number four, the fourth one is Satan. The ruler of this world's coming. What's the cure? Be alert to his devices and resist him. And the last, the fear of the unknown. Arise, let us go from here. What is the cure? Trust God for your future. Are you experiencing God's peace? Is there something that is robbing you of your peace? Do you have a fearful and a troubled heart over a situation you cannot control? My dear sister, pray and seek heavenly things. Or maybe it's a change or experience in a relationship. Maybe a son or a daughter has left home for college or they're getting married. Maybe a friend is moving away. Maybe a husband has divorced you. Maybe your parent has died. Remember, God is sovereign. Cling to the comfort of the dear Holy Spirit. Maybe it's a lack of love for God that has stolen your peace. Maybe your heart is calloused and you're cold against the Lord. Ladies, repent. Do what you did when you first loved Christ. Maybe it's Satan. Maybe Satan's taken your peace. Ladies, resist him. Be sober. Be alert. Know yourself. I hope you know what your weaknesses are. I know my weaknesses. I know where Satan attacks me. Be alert to the devices he uses in your life. And lastly, maybe it's the fear of un the unknown. Maybe you have a fear of tomorrow. Ladies, trust in God. For the Christian, there's no excuse for lack of peace. Jesus said, peace I leave you, my peace I give to you. Nothing you and I are facing today should rob us of the peace that is promised to us, the peace that surpasses all understanding. So to wrap it all up very quickly, are you grounded? Are you grounded in Christ by abiding in him or are you grounded in chaos by avoiding him? Are you grounded in the word by being disciplined in the word and prayer or are you grounded in the world by being dedicated to the world and all its problems? Are you grounded in biblical womanhood by knowing what your role is in the church and in the home? Or are you grounded in unbiblical womanhood by listening to all the lies the world feeds you regarding your role at home and in the church? And lastly, are you grounded in this shaky world by knowing the things that steal your peace? Or are you grounded in all this unsettling news which has robbed you of your peace? What are you grounded in? Ladies, may we be, as Paul says to the church at Colossae, may we be presented holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight by continuing in our faith, grounded and settled, and never be moved away from the hope of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this precious time with these precious women. Oh, Lord, please use your word. I know it doesn't return void. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. And so, Father, will you take the words that have been spoken this weekend and use them to make permanent changes in the lives of all of us, Lord, that we might be women that are grounded in the truths of the gospel and in the truths of your word. And we ask this, Father, not for any glory of our own, but so that Christ would be put on display in a very troubling world. And we ask this, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What a wonderful encouragement to hear. What a wonderful time it has been together. Would you stand and sing with me one last time if you're able?
In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on the cross as Jesus died, the For every sin on him was laid Here in the death of Christ I live There in the ground his body lay Light of the world by darkness Then what? Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine and bought with the precious blood of Christ. And this is how we can live in a shaky world, no guilt in life and no fear in death. No guilt in life and no fear in death and this is the power of christ in me from life's first cry to final breath jesus commands my destiny and no power of hell no scheme of man can Till he returns or he calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand no power no power of hell and no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or he calls me home here Till he, till he returns or he calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> 